Hello, everybody. We're a little early, but welcome. Um, we're going to begin in just a few minutes. Uh, you've all been through the drill here in this Zoom era. You know that we need to get to critical mass, and uh, we're expecting the congressman here any minute. And Bill Rowe, my good friend, who's been a loyal part of our family this year, <laughs> glad we could bring you some Arizona-specific programming uh, today. Um, and uh, here's Ruben. Let me let me get him in here. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, let me, um, I need to elevate you up to uh, promote to you to a panelist, Ruben, hold on. That should have happened. Is your camera, Ruben, do you have a camera on? Okay, let's try this. Hold on. I think you have to unmute me. Yep, here we go, give me a second here. Yep. And do you have the ability, Ruben, to turn, can you see a switch that allows you to turn your camera on and off? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so turn on your camera. It says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Let's do it again. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Bad Simon. Let me see what I can do here. All right. Here, I'm going to make you an even more elevated figure here. Now, try it again, Ruben. Ready. There we go. There we Sorry go. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, welcome. Thank you for, Thank you. for being here. Uh, we've got we've got a good crew today. Um, I generally try to start on time and and end on time, so I'm going to okay. jump right in if you're ready to go. Is that go. okay? Thank you for coming, and uh, thanks all. I, I'm going to start just by sharing. So, the premise of this conversation today is that. Um, we are going to try to, over the coming months, spend a little bit of time and energy shining a light on one region of the United States. When you look at sort of the, the ch demographic changes that have happened, Trump voters, right, the industrial north, there's all these stories about regions, the country. I think one area of the country that's not gotten enough attention, frankly, is the Southwest and what I call the Mexican American parts of the United States. Uh, there's been a dramatic political transformation of this region over the last 20 years. I think it, it is not in anywhere, the scale of it, I think is not well understood. We sort of got an inkling of it by the fact that we were even competitive in Texas or becoming competitive, which is really like the last state in the region that in the dominoes that have fallen from California to New Mexico, right? You go through the list. You know, Texas is the, you know, we always thought Arizona was next. Well, Arizona's happened and we're gonna be spending most of today talking about that. But I wanna just create, if you just bear with me here, I wanna just put up on the screen for a second um, to show you just some, I've been number crunching on this a little bit. And for those of you who don't know, NDN um, got into this business, Ken Salazar, the former Senator from Colorado uh, dragged me and my organization into running Spanish language ads in the 2002 Senate race in Colorado. And then in 2004, we ran a, a $6 million national campaign where we went up against Bush in five states, in Florida and the four Southwestern states. Ruben, we actually spent a million and a half dollars in Spanish in Arizona in 2004. And so part of the goal of this campaign that we ran back then was to win the heavily Hispanic areas of the country back from Bush, who had used an effective strategy to win Florida and the Southwest. If you, you know, we won Arizona in 1996. And if you go back and look at the electoral college maps of those area of those of those of those times, you're going to see that the only states that Bush flipped from 96 to 2000 and 2004 that were so critical to him winning his incredibly narrow victories were heavily Hispanic states in the Southwest and in Florida. Everything else stayed static. And so the Hispanic vote actually was responsible for delivering Bush the White House in 2000 and 2004. 
it's not a question of whether the Hispanic vote matters. It already delivered a you know, Republican president. And we were involved in developing a response. And part of that response was to flip this region back to being democratic, right, as it had been, and obviously with a vastly different population. So look at these numbers I've just thrown together here. I'm going to go through this quickly, and then we're going to turn to Ruben. If you look at Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada in 2004, we won no electoral college votes. We only had two Senate seats of the eight. We only had six House seats, and we had no governorships. 16 years later, we have all the electoral college votes, all the Senate seats. We've gained eight seats in the House, right, from where we were, and we have three of the four governorships now, with Ducey being the last one to fall. This is a dramatic transformation, um, and in, I would argue it's the most significant geographic transformation that's happened in any region of the country in the last 16 years. If you then expand that uh, map to include Texas and California, you can see how significant you know, this is becoming. I mean, just how much power Democrats are getting from this region of the country, right? Where we used to get very little, and yeah. now we're getting, you know, this is the reason that we're competitive in the Senate is because of this region of the country. Our majority in the House is in part due to our success in this region of the country. And obviously 86 electoral college votes is an awful lot of electoral college votes in what has been a close electoral college. And I think it's really just important to reflect that we now have both the vice president and the speaker coming from this region of the United States, what I call the heavily Mexican American part of the United States. For those of you who don't know, Kamala Harris is the first Western Democrat to ever serve as president or vice president in the history of the Democratic Party. Pretty interesting statistic, right? We know that Ben Ray Lujan was chairman of the DCCC from New Mexico in 2018. Senator Cortez Masto was chair of the DSCC this cycle. And we know that uh, uh, Governor Christian Lujan is going to be the head of the DGA in this coming cycle. And I heard, Ruben, that you are going to be also leading Bold Pack, the Hispanic Pack in the House this school. And so this region, I think, has become not just a sign of transformation, but it's been critical to our modern majority and our ability to be competitive at a national level. And so this is a story that I think I want to be telling. For those of you who don't know, my wife uh, grew up in New Mexico, uh, and we, I was married there. We spent a lot of time there. Ruben knows that I used to spend every spring training in Arizona with my baseball mad children. And so, you know, this is a part of the country that I've spent a lot of time in, and we're going to be working very hard to tell this story. But the most important part of this story this year was what happened in Arizona. And, um, you know, we now, amazingly, we own both Senate seats. Uh, Joe Biden won the Electoral College votes there. And when I think about the transformation that's happened in Arizona, which was the most difficult of all of these, by the way, Texas is next, but Arizona was always going to be very hard. The state that gave us Barry Goldwater and John McCain and the very powerful Republicans there for a long time, is that, you know, I think about Ruben Gallego, right, a congressman who was a state rep, but who, uh, and has been a leader here in Congress. He's a combat veteran, all those things that you know about him. But what people don't know about him in Washington is that he was the one, he was the one of the first organizers of the, of the Hispanic vote in Arizona in a way that was consequential and meaningful and was a real community organizer and leader and has helped lead this transition from a state that was a Republican red state to now one that's purple or lean blue, whatever it's gonna be in the coming years. And so I just asked Ruben to come on today to talk and to reflect frankly a little bit on this experience. It's an amazing achievement. I mean, we just had Mark Kelly, you know, uh, you know sworn in this week. Uh, Arizona was, confer you know, was um, confirmed as a Biden state on Monday, right? And I just wanted to invite Ruben to share some reflections on this and for us to have a conversation with some old friends today. We've got a good group of people on here today, Ruben. We've got a bunch of Arizonans I see on, some, uh, ready to dive in, you know, when you're, when we go to the Q&A. And, uh, but thank you for being here and, and just congratulations. I know how much work you put into this for how long. It must feel really good. So thank you. And, and Simon, thank you for always believing in Arizona. And I still remember our, I think the first time we met was at the Democratic Party back in 2008. And, uh, I was quite vocal uh, back in the day, but uh, you you certainly uh, you know took uh, my advice and and took many of our advices uh, on the ground, and we really appreciate it. And, 
I'm glad that all, all of our work has has continued. And look, it is shocking to me um, that that we are where we are. Um, you know, I moved to Arizona in late in 2005, straight out of Iraq, um, and uh, quickly got involved in organizing, uh, largely um, with the the, the Democratic Party. Um, but eventually continue with the Democratic Party, but also uh, helping some organizations uh, get going, including one of them called CASE, Center for Arizona Sustainable Economy, something that was largely funded by Unite Here, uh, that also worked with other great groups called like uh, Lucha, Mi Familia Vota, One Arizona was our big uh, umbrella group. And then there was just other little organizing that, that we did informally. One of the things that many of us younger activists realized, especially after SB 1070, was that we didn't just you know, as we tend to say, the, the show me your papers law for those people that don't remember, that basically said if the police suspected you were in this country legally, they could pull you over without any just cause. And when a state is 30% Latino, that's going to be a lot of us getting pulled over. So one of the things that we recognize as, as Latino, especially young Latinos, is that the reason we, we, we lost the argument SB 1070 is because we weren't getting taken seriously by anybody. Not by the Democrats, not by the Republicans, not by the business community. They felt they could just, you know, uh, you know, throw us aside, and they just wanted to kind of move on. And one of the things that we quickly did after that, starting in 2011, is that we uh, opened up the maps and realized redistricting is coming up, uh, and we have a lot of Republicans uh, in Democratic Latino districts, and we just started plugging and and plugging in people and running them for office. And we basically started uh, a, a movement. Uh, where, where Republicans, the Chamber of Commerce, all started seeing some of their best buddies losing elections. And so we made it very clear that this was a consequence of you picking on the Latino community. And from that movement, you actually started creating a lot of new leaders uh, in, in overall in Arizona. So I was one of them, uh, for example, uh, I ended up becoming a state rep, eventually a system earlier in, the, in Congress. Uh, my, uh, the mayor of Phoenix, uh, Kate Gallego, was also one of those activists. Uh, and she uh, ended up, you know, being mayor, probably going out to further things. Raquel Turan is uh, another great example. She was arrested by Sheriff Joe Arpaio for protesting him. Now she is uh, rising in the Arizona Democratic Party, and it will be the Arizona Democratic Party chair and is a state house uh, member. And all these young men and women that ran for offices created their own little environments of activism uh, and grassroots activism. Uh, and we also fed right back into the Democratic Party. I think there's a there's some kind of misconception up there that the you know I think some of are trying to push that somehow the movement that happened in Arizona was separate from the Democratic Party. It was not. Uh, it was in conjunction. Uh, so yes, there were some C4s that were doing border registration, and yes, you know there was politicians that were you know pushing their own uh, you know their own grassroots movements. But we always were working in conjunction with the Democratic Party. Um, but it was time consuming. And that was the hardest thing. We, we could not find all the money we needed because we were always the kind of left behind stepchild, right? Colorado was winning. Uh, you know, they had U.S. senators. Uh, you know, they had, they had won in 2008 for uh, President uh, Obama. New Mexico had, had already turned. Uh, Florida was always, you know, the, the, you know the, 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 the sunshine state. That would never happen, in my opinion, but that's a different story. Um, and so when it was time for us to get that type of funding that we needed to really push us over top, we were always skipped over. 2008 was skipped over because John McCain was on the ticket. We weren't going to win Arizona. 2012, uh, the Obama campaign decided they just need to hold what they had. They didn't need to add any more. And Mitt Romney uh, was a type of Republican that, that would not be, I think, caustic enough for us to put the coalition together. 2016, you know, I was a big advocate for for uh, full investment in Arizona 2016, I, I think we could have turned the state. No one really believed in us until basically the last month, and that's not how you win races. And then 2018, 2020 is really when we hit uh, the right amount of investment uh, and, and were able to turn the state. And this year, you know, a lot of us are disappointed in Arizona. Yes, we did win the Senate seat. Uh, we won another statewide seat. Um, we picked up something, in, some in the House, I think some in the Senate. We feel we came very close to pulling a lot of kind of stories. We were this close to, I, I think, making full sweeps. There's a lot of things that happened. I think one of the things that we never realized is how much uh, Donald Trump can get out the vote among his white rural base, which makes a difference. Um, but what we did not see, unlike other states, and I think something we have discussed is the slippage that you saw uh, among Latinos. 
Uh, you know, the only slippage we really saw among Latinos were in rural, Lat rural Arizona, and only in, the, in one part of rural Arizona that's on the border where we have a lot of families that work for Border Patrol. <laughs> and you're just not going, that's just not going to change. But we did see Latino turnout spike uh, and just go through the roof. Uh, and there's no way that uh, President, we were going to have President Biden without uh, him hitting 70% uh, of the vote and at least Latino turnout being somewhere between 20 and 22% of the electorate. And that's the number that we'd always been reaching. That's the thing that we as uh, young activists, organizers, candidates, were always reaching for. We knew that when we can get the Latino vote out at up to 20% and at 70% efficacy for Democrats, that we could sweep the state. And that's the thing that we've been going. Now, it was a long, long time coming. Uh, and the reason why you know we didn't have the slippage you see in other states is because the Latino community in Arizona had been educated and organized over 10 years, right? And so they weren't just gonna be able to, you know, there wasn't gonna be slippage to this community because it, you know, especially in a time of COVID when there's less communication, they're not just gonna be able to come by through, you know, misinformation and propaganda. Um, you know, I, you know, for example, I, I know the same families I've been walking <laughs> since 2010. Uh, I've actually talked about, uh, every time I go to the door, I, you know, remember a lot of them and I actually talk about the progression of their kids. Like I remember I met one family um, in 2010, when I was first, first door knocking, and I met uh, this woman, and she was telling me her kid's going to go to NAU. And by the time I came back in 2012, her kid was at NAU and was rushing a fraternity. One of my, my fraternities is called Sigma Chi. Uh, and by the time I came back, uh, you know, in uh, 2014, uh, you know, he was on his way to, to graduating. And I saw her again uh, in, in 2020, and now he's got a kid. You know, so this is the type of activism when I say, and you hear me talk about in the press, is that it has to be consistent. You can't just come around two months before the election. Uh, and also you need to keep the infrastructure in place. One of the things that we were able to do in Arizona, the Democratic Party, all these C4s, even the politicians, that we stayed busy. 2010 election's over, boom, move on to 2011. We take the city councils, take school board. 2012, we go back into the state. Into the state. We try to get Carmona elected. We try to take congressional seats. Uh, we do take at least one uh, with, uh, we take two actually that year. Uh, then we, we move into 2013. We take the city of Phoenix races, the city council races, city of Tucson, and we keep doing it over and over again. And every year we're just getting better and better. We're getting better organizers and they stay around. We don't leave town every year. So by the time 2020 rolls around, Biden did start late in Arizona, not because he didn't want to start earlier, but because of uh, the, well, number one, COVID, number two, the late primary. By the time he got to, and his team got to Arizona, we were already organizing ourselves. Uh, we had already been, you know, doing our, our community meetings. Uh, you know, when the, when, when the Biden people asked me to put together a Latino leaders uh, network for Arizona, I basically just hit a send button that I had had for the last, you know, 10 years. And we were going by the next day and we already had our phone banks going and, and we had our walks when we started walking again. So that is what I, 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 feel is not happening in other parts of the country. You do see it in Nevada, for example. Uh, but if you want to talk about places that you could have that kind of long-term long infrastructure work, you could do that in Texas, but it requires a lot of money. You could do that in Florida, but it requires a lot of money. But if you do it, it does have success. Uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't, the, the one problem I would always say is, you know, long-term organizing doesn't have a lobby. Long-term organizing doesn't have really, really, you know, expensive consultants that make a lot of money uh, for it. Uh, and you don't see return on your investment for years. Uh, but when it happens, it's big. So, uh, you know, we're very lucky in Arizona. Again, we had a lot of things that went well with us, but you just had a lot of people that, that stuck it out for years, just believing in us. Um, even, you know, a, a lot of the activists, we should have given up, many of us probably should have just given up years ago when, you know, 2014, we got wiped out. All of our work got wiped out in 2014 when we came back into it. Uh, and now, you know, I feel, you know, the, the next 10 years are going to be good for Arizona. And I think if, if some people will take some of the lessons that we learned from here, I think we could be, you know, really using the Southwest as really being the powerhouse for the Democratic Party. How do you, a couple questions, Ruben, and then we'll open it up to the, yeah. uh, to the, to the group is that, um, what role do you think Cindy, Mc, Cindy McCain played, uh, John McCain's wife in this particular, I, I get asked this all the time. That's yeah. why I'm asking you. I'm curious what you think. Well, I think, in, you know, in Arizona, I remember the, the population of Arizona is about 31% Latino. And in terms of, again, being part of the electorate, the winning percentages get up to 20%. Uh, 
Um, no Democrat can win statewide with just Latinos or just with Anglo voters or just with swing Republican voters. Um, look, we won by 10,000 votes in Arizona. So every, every big count, uh, I think her uh, advocacy gave a lot of permission to moderates uh, that are more conservative leading moderates, Republicans to come over and vote. Um, Native Americans, by the way, we should really point out also came out and voted in amazing numbers. Uh, we would not have won the state without them, and we would not have won the state without, without Latinos. So in that regard, yes, it matters. Was it the uh, silver bullet? No, but again, there is no silver bullet to Arizona. You have to win with the right coalition and to win with the right candidates too. You know, we, we ran the right candidates that appealed to the Latino community, which is a little more left-leaning, uh, but also can bring in moderates uh, into that coalition, which is what how you see the success of cinema and how now you also see the success of, um, of Mark Kelly. The one thing I would say that's very promising, though, is that we got our first statewide elected Latina, Anna Tovar, uh, mayor of a small town in my district, just a great, great friend of mine, uh, quite a, a talented uh, a politician. Uh, and the fact that she was able to win and came in first place versus a lot of white dudes uh, tells us that there is a very strong movement happening uh, with in terms of Latina women being able to run and win statewide. I have one other question is that, can you reflect a little bit about uh, so much of Trump's energy around immigration and the border has manifested itself in Arizona, Texas a great deal, but also Arizona. Mm -hmm. what, what happens now in your mind? I mean, what kind of repair has to be done? Uh, we don't have control of this, you know, we may not have control of the Senate the Senate has been very reluctant to, you know, historically been reluctant, particularly since McCain left. Uh, Flake and McCain were really important Republicans to bring other Republicans along in the Senate. What's your sense about what happens now and how is it playing out in Arizona? Well, look, and immigration, while is important, is not the most important issue to Latinos. It's just this kind of a, a, a bear, it's a, a litmus test of how you're going to be on other issues. Um, I think we're, we're gonna have to have President Biden use whatever executive orders he can to go as far as he can when it comes to immigration. Uh, I think it's also important that we as Democrats in the House and the Senate call the bluff uh, on Republicans because there is, a, you know, in my opinion, misinformation among the Latino community that Republicans also want immigration reform, but they just can't for whatever reason, right? Uh, you know, we have a very good bipartisan ag job bill uh, that got passed last year in the House uh, both by the business and the agricultural community would help, um, you know, put 3 million uh, people on a pathway to citizenship, bring legal, you know, give uh, green cards uh, temporarily to families uh, until they can get on the path to citizenship. We should bring that back up. It was bipartisan then. Let's see, you know, what happens and let's push it uh, to the Senate and make and call out the Senate for again being obstructionist. Uh, but we're going to have to do everything we can, I think, in the meantime, to uh, allow or not to allow, but to, to give something back to the Latino community because they have, they are frustrated. You know, they're waiting around for immigration reform. It, you know, it's, you got to remember Latino families tend to be also mixed families um, or very close to other families. I, I, for one, know I have family members that are in all uh, schedules of, of legality in this country. They're here uh, undocumented. They're here, uh, you know, with green cards. Some of them are here uh, you know, they're firstborn uh, of, of undocumented people. Uh, and then I have family members that work for ICE uh, and for Border Patrol. <laughs> so, you know, I, I see the, the whole scale of it. Uh, but, you know, there is a, a sense that, you know, they just want to get this done. Great. Well, listen, thank you, uh, Ruben. Congratulations again. I want to open it up now yeah. to our the audience here. Uh, two ways to ask questions, folks. One is you can uh, jot a question down in the Q&A, um, and I can read it uh, to Ruben. If any of you want to jump in and ask your question where we can hear your own voice, we can do that as well. You hit the raise hand feature uh, at the bottom. I think all of us have now been doing enough Zooms that we <laughs> know how this stuff all works. Um, but let's uh, have at it. Who's got a question or a comment for, for Ruben today? Ruben, I've been doing a lot of political stuff over the last couple of months. I don't usually have a shy audience. Bill Rowe, do you know? I don't know if you know hey, Bill. Bill, how have you been? Bill, Bill, do you have a question? Are you still on, Bill? I'm just going to call on you and see if you want to jump in with anything. He's he's a, a donor to NDN, Bill, and has been an active member in our many of our calls. Did he, yeah. did he lose you, Bill? 
I don't know. You were on earlier. Bill, Bill you know. single-handedly kept the Arizona De Democratic Party alive, too. That's the other thing I think people don't recognize. The Arizona Democratic Party, unlike many other parties, exists ev throughout the whole you know, election cycle. We don't shut down after an election. And we, and I, I was surprised when I met, I go to other parties and I talk to their, you know, what they do. And they, they basically shut down after election. They keep a comms person, uh, an executive director, and that's about it. It, it. Because of people like Bill Rowe, we actually kept active every year. And we have active staff every year. It's a very professionalized staff. Well, and you have those off year city elections, right? right. Which is, which creates the, um, and I, and oh, we did get a few questions here. Sure. Let me, um, Okay. Um, it's first questions from Bill, and not a hey, big hey, surprise. Hey. Uh, redistricting. Can you comment a little bit on redistricting and how your what your take is and what's going to happen in redistricting? Well, redistricting in Arizona, I think, is not going to go as well because the the the, pres the um, pardon me um, the governor has appointed a lot of the public court that's going to help basically stack the redistricting initiative down to someone I think that'd be more Republican leaning. I do, however, think that. Their, their ability to gerrymander is going to be fairly limited. The growth that they've seen in the state is, you know, is very localized. It's all Maricopa County. There's some ex-urban growth uh, in Pinal County. It's very Republican. But in order for them to use that ex-urban growth to, you know, create more Democratic districts, you're going to have to create some really funky lines. At the same time, you have districts like mine, which is one of the fastest growing districts in the country. And I'm oversubscribed probably somewhere between 75 and 100,000. Um, so someone's going to have to take all those Democrats because I, really, I don't have any Republican areas. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that has been done in the past where Republicans have come to members of Congress, specifically uh, members of Congress of color, and have asked them to, you know, pack their districts more. So for me, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't think it actually benefits the Latino community for all Latinos to be packed into one district. It's probably better for us to be, you know, have representation, but also have significant representation in other districts that way you know, you have more members that are responsive to us. So I think, you know, on my front, I'm going to be working a lot with uh, whatever legal entities we can establish to make sure that they don't pack us all in uh, together. Uh, and as for redistricting, you know, in the state level, I think uh, State House, State Senate, it's going to be very difficult for us. Now, again, I think the growth is going to eventually take over their maps. Uh, and uh, we, we may not be successful in 2022, but I think by 24, uh, in 26, we'll, we should be able to uh, take the state house uh, and, and maybe the state senate. Ruben, what's your sense about, um, and Nick, I'm going to get to your question in a second, but what's your sense about what it means now for people that move into the state who may be 30 years old and come in for a job, yeah. to state that, you know, 10 years ago, it was irrevocably Republican, now it's up for grabs. Do you sense, get a sense that there's gonna be far more people now who may more immediately identify as a Democrat or be open to being a Democrat as opposed to feeling like, well, everyone's a Republican, so I'll be a Republican is, mm -hmm. what's kind of tipping, I mean, what kind of a well, impact do you think that's gonna have? It, yeah, psychologically it matters, Simon. So, you know, I represent a very suburban growth area, even though it's in the city of Phoenix, huge track housing. Um, and, uh, you know, very mixed areas though, uh, you know, working class Latinos, a lot of retired African-Americans, also a big growing population in Arizona. Um, and, and uh, you know, younger white families coming to Arizona to buy homes because they can't buy homes in other places or they're following their jobs. And when I would, every year I'd go door knocking, um, I would knock on a door of it, someone who's registered independent and I'd tell them who I was and they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a Democrat, but I don't put anything up, this is a Republican area. I'm like, this is not a Republican area. This is actually a very Democratic area. And I explained to them like the whole district, uh, but there is going to be more of that, I, I would say affiliation or feeling like it's okay to affiliate with the Democratic party now that we have a lot more, uh, you know, outstanding representation, right? At this, you know, federal level. Um, and certainly now even at the local level, it's happening. Yeah, I think it's it's sort of what happened in Virginia when Virginia tipped, in, and you're going to see this potentially in Georgia, Arizona. I mean, the people who come into the state, the new there's going to be people who are going to be more open to affiliate, and and yeah. it's a uh, it's why the the constant work you're doing with new voters or regular voters really matters because they they need to be touched, they need to be welcomed into the family. So mm -hmm. let me get to Nick Riccardi, uh, Ruben. I don't know if you know Nick, but he's an AP reporter based in. Denver, very smart guy, uh, and we've an old friend. 
He said, Congressman, this may be a chicken and egg question. You talked about the importance of organizing and preventing slippage among Latinos this cycle. How much of a factor is the memory of the Arpaio 1070 fights and the voters in making them more inherently suspicious of Republicans in Arizona, for example? So it, it does matter, but the benefit, the real benefit of Arpaio and SB 1070 is the fact that it helped create the organizations and the organizers and the activists that turned as to turn 2020 blue. Um, you know, it, Latinos are like any other demographic, you know, they're it's it's what have you done for me lately, right? And they're willing to move on because like anybody else, they care about the basics uh, of life, you know, housing, uh, schools, uh, you know, safety. Uh, and if, if, you know, someone has moved on then, or if that issue is no longer pertinent, then they will look for the next thing. So um, yes, there was some level of that, that people were able to, you know, hang on to these old views of Republicans. Uh, but um, it really is the organizing that happens every year. It's the education really that happens every year. Um, you know, when we educate a voter, you know, once, uh, you know, it's not that you, they carry that for the rest of their lives. Like they know who their state reps, state senators are, members of Congress. They know how to, you know, uh, vote. They know how to look up, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what's what's actually happening. That's definitely the biggest difference. And, you know, I'll give you a good example. You know, one of the things that we never talk about is the way that we, and I say we, the, the big we in Arizona, the, the organizations, Democratic Party and the individual members of Congress are politicians, we also educated Latinos how to vote by mail. When in 2010, you know, Repu you look at 2000, Republicans had a huge advantage in vote by mail. By 2020, we've closed and surpassed that advantage. And so that's why when, you know, everything was going, you know, to VBM, Arizona, we were already ready to go. We've known how to work that process uh, forever. So much so that the Republican state house is trying to change vote by mail because now, Latinos are more likely to use it than, than they were, even though it was designed for Republican elderly retirees. So, um, you know, so yes, your premise is somewhat true, but it's the actual organizing that happened around those issues. I think that's, that, that made us the, the, the state that we are now. The muscle, that the muscle. created the muscle. Well, the, mu the muscle memory too. Again, it's all about, you know, the, the organizers that we trained in 2010, I got to go find the, I have pictures of me, you know, back in the day without beard and uh, with, with, with no beard and about 20 pounds lighter, uh, actually uh, organizing and training young young activists uh, with, you know, the grandson of Cesar Chavez around SB 1070. And now a lot of them ended up being, you know, the activists that we saw turn the state blue. Too many good craft breweries in, in Arizona, I think. <laughs> it's <isn't> just that. <laughs> um, Bill uh, had another uh, comment and I want to encourage others to jump in here uh, about we're going to get a 10th congressional seat, right? Yeah. How do you think that's going to, uh, how do you think that's going to play out? Well, it's, it's going to be Maricopa County. Um, I'm hoping it's on the West side. It will probably be a marginally Republican district with a sizable Latino population. And I think that's what we should uh, go for. Um, and I think, you know, if we want that to happen, that might be the best compromise. If not, they're going to put it on the East side. Uh, East Valley and make it a very more deep Mormon Republican district uh, with some ex-urban uh, portions of it. Uh, but putting a district that is marginally compared to us with a size of the population with the right type of organizing, we can, we can turn that district. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Jessica Montoya Coggin. She said, oh, hey, how you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, writing from Texas, Texas, we got Slaughtered. I, I hate to use the term. We had a tough time is a yeah. better way to say it. In our legislative races, often people running way behind Biden. What advice would you give the Texas Democratic Party as we look to rebuild in 2022? So actually, one of the things I, I was looking at the map, you know, Texas is is big and small because you have a lot of county parties there, right? Because you have some fairly small counties along the border. I, I honestly think like you should try to reinvigorate your county party system. Um, and I think you need to invest in local races and start bringing in more Democrats elected to these local races, right? So that your small town mayor, your small town judges, all that kind of stuff. And then we should actually train these uh, politicians to organize themselves, right? Because a lot of them just get elected, but they actually don't know how to organize. And that's the thing people forget. Just because you're an elected official doesn't mean you're a good organizer. It just means you know how to put your name on the damn ballot, right? In some states, all you got to do is pay, pay for, to get on the ballot, right? Um, 
but we should actually train them how to organize and how to communicate, right? Every little small town mayor in, uh, you know, in Texas or sizable, whatever it is, should have their own YouTube channel, should have their own, uh, you know, social media following so they could, you know, spread their message, uh, you know, so that way they become the trusted voice for the community there. Uh, and if you do that, you're going to have stronger, uh, you know, the stronger infrastructure that could withstand these like crazy elections where something like the misinformation that came from the, the Trump campaign uh, can, uh, you could withstand those kind of waves. And you could actually turn that on every election cycle, right? And I think that's the one thing that, you know, we consistently do not do is that we do not invest in a long-term political infrastructure, especially in these rural areas. Until you can win Texas with just like urban uh, and suburban voters, you're going to have to make sure you keep investing in these uh, other areas, right? So the Rio Grande Valley uh, and, you know, in other parts of Texas. But the good thing about it is that small investment in those little areas, uh, you know, is really cheap, but in the long term can be, you know, very beneficial. Uh, so the ROI is higher. The uh, thing is, it's not a very sexy thing. You know, everyone wants to do voter registration and, and do that. Voter registration without political infrastructure makes zero sense. You're basically building a house uh, on quicksand, right? You first have to have political infrastructure, then you do voter registration because the political infrastructure activates and holds the voter registration year in and year out. Ruben, maybe one thing we can think about is now that you're going to be in charge of Bold Pack is developing a whole Texas project for Bold Pack and, you know, taking some of this learning from Arizona and doing trainings down there and helping inform the strategy down there. And as you pointed out, I mean, you're going to have some resources. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the biggest, if you really look at, you know, where can you grow the most Hispanics members of Congress? For Bold Pack, uh, Texas is obviously going to be really critical to that. So we will, you know, we will I, with approval of my board, one of the things I actually want to do is to do training camps uh, uh, twice a year on the East Coast and the West Coast. And maybe we'll forget West Coast, maybe we'll just Texas or whatever. But basically to train uh, politicians to learn how to organize and how and, and how to effectively turn turn out the vote. Uh, but we're, you know, if there is going to be a Texas strategy, we, you know, we believe in local uh, collaboration uh, and investment. You know, because I can leave town, but there's someone needs to be there to kind of keep keep the ball rolling. Well, we should we should talk about that. There's some exciting opportunities, I think. And I don't know if Beto is going to run again for governor, um, but we got to keep we got to keep fighting there. I mean, that's yeah. just uh, the stakes are so high. And uh, let me um, let me. Oh, Bill has another question. Uh, what can we do to improve the turnout across Arizona with all sectors of the electorate, Ruben? Well, I would say uh, if we if we can get automatic voter registration on the ballot by 2024, that would do it. Um, other than that, the largest thing that we need to do is the demographic that has the hardest time, we have the hardest time keeping the registration, are younger Latinos. And that's because between election cycles, they will probably move two times. And between presidential elections, they probably move three to four times. Uh, so the biggest help that we had so far was the fact that we moved uh, a lot more to VBM vote by mail, because then Latinos will just go back to their old house and pick up their, their ballots, right? Um, and the fact that we have uh, at-large voting precincts. So you don't actually have to go to your precinct to vote. You can vote to, go to any precinct and they'll print out your ballot. So we need to keep that. And I guarantee you the Republicans, that's the first thing they're gonna to try to change. They're gonna to try to make it harder to vote by mail. And they're gonna to try to make it so you can't just go to any polling place near your job and it'll pull up your ballot. They're gonna make you go to your, your precinct. So we're gonna to have to block uh, those two. Uh, and then uh, just a consistent re-registration. We're just gonna lose people every year through the purge that happens. It's not even nefarious purge. It's just the fact that again, we move, we have a law in the books that says we send the Secretary of State will send you two pieces of mail. You're gonna respond. You're you're deemed you're still on the rolls, but you're inactive at that point. Eventually, you get purged. Uh, so every year, you know, in addition to voter registration, new voter registration, we need to do re-registration. And I think we can do that by phone, by text. There's a lot of things that we don't have to just do on the door-to-door -door effort. Yeah, I think I think Ruben, one of the um, 
the things that in general, I think we have to do a lot of thinking about, and I really appreciate the way you talked about this, is that we did very, very well with young people in this election. Uh, we did very well with young people in the 2018 election. We actually had a better performance with 18 to 29 year olds in 2018 than, we, than Obama did in 2008. Um, we still did very well this cycle. Uh, Gen Z, you know, uh, which is now this new generation post-millennial numbers were, you know, in the in high 20s, low 30s. And, you know, we had a lot of, uh, we had the highest youth turnout as a percentage of registration, potentially in the modern era of American politics. So in addition to the registration, as you pointed out, we have a lot of new people who we need to turn from being irregular or episodic voters into regular voters. And I think that's gonna be a, a whole party-wide project um, because of just the sheer enormity of the youth turnout this time. It was incredible, particularly given how disrupted the lives of young people have been by COVID. I mean, young people have been really impacted by COVID. And perhaps that's part of what drove that the turnout numbers to be so high. But we have some, we have, there's a lot of interesting work to be done with young people uh, this cycle and, mm -hmm. um, you know, coming up. Well, I, I would say on the, the, the way to keep young people engaged is to actually deliver. And so you can, you get young people to vote once, but nothing changes. It's going to be hard for you to get them back. So I do think like some policy wins have to come out of this election in order for them to feel that their vote was uh, validated. Agreed. Okay, last question here from Jay. Um, the, uh, <laughs> Ruben, you knew you were gonna get this. Can you elaborate on your comments regarding the party being too optimistic in Florida, right? <laughs> ah, yeah. Yes, you knew you were gonna get somebody asking about that, right? Well, as I always, I, I have a joke, like, you know, when, especially this year when I was trying to talk to donors, like, invest in Arizona because Florida is going to Florida you. Um, <laughs> look, it is, a, it, it is a very, you know, I was actually campaigning down in, in I was very comfortable in Arizona. I actually was campaigning down Miami-Dade in the Columbian community for the last two weeks, uh, two weekends of the election. Um, I think there's a couple of things that, that, that need fixing in Florida and we have to also recognize it is so varied, right? The population is so varied. Even on Latinos, it's so diverse, right? Um, and in order for you to even like really truly win in the Latino community, you're not just investing in Mexican Americans. You got to go Cubans, Venezuelans, Colombians, uh, Central Americans, and then even the generational differences there. And then you have your Puerto Ricans uh, that are really having a, a huge effect in the Central I-4 corridor. Plus, then you have your retirees, and then you have your younger families, and you have your larger larger African American community. Then you have the Panhandle. So all these basically all of America is squished in there, but there is, in my opinion, the political infrastructure from Florida has not at all involved and improved since the year 2000. Year in and year out, we're losing elections uh, in Florida by small margins sometimes, but, you know, it, it's as if, as if we don't learn. You know, I was in, um, I was actually when I was thinking of considering actually running for Senate myself uh, early uh, for this seat, it was, uh, uh, there was the DS was having an event down in, in Florida uh, with their donors and I attended. And uh, while I was there, I went and met with some of my, uh, my big Latino donors that I have down there, I had some dinners and I was asking them about this race that Nelson was going to have against um, uh, the current center. What's his name? Scott. Scott. And uh, they were all telling me, you know, I felt very optimistic. I'm like, well, you know, this big Puerto Rican influence is like, you don't know what's been happening here. Scott has been meeting almost every plane of new Puerto Ricans, you know, as they come in. He's been advertising in Puerto Rican radio, like this is how you get your food stamps, this is how you get your housing, you know, con you know, made gave gave Puerto Ricans in-state tuition, you know, all these things. And when I went back and reported back to the DS about this, this is before Cortez Masso was in charge, they said, no, we have we have Florida in the bag. You cannot ever trust that. Um, you know, if you look down in Florida right now, for example, our, part of our biggest problem is that we don't have uh, Latino, we don't really have Latino media personalities to spread the democratic message. The Republican party does, right? They have like YouTube influencers that are speaking Republican messaging points every day. We have no presence there whatsoever. And I don't see anybody that's willing to make uh, that investment. Uh, and, you know, we're gonna come up at an election in 20, 
uh, you know, I think uh, what's presidential, or wait, what are we coming up now? 2022 is going to be a Senate race. You know, I think they're going to try to do this. Uh, every politician is going to try to do the same thing. They're going to try to hold their own in Miami and then pull as many suburban votes as possible and hopefully win with the I-4 corridor. And I think that's just not going to happen. Unless you're starting to run that race right now. Unless you actually just start pushing back on the Republican propaganda that, that's within the Cuban community, within the Colombian community, you start that now, 2022 is going to be a real uphill battle. You know, we, NDN, um, working with Joe Garcia, your yeah, I'm colleague, Joe. Uh, Joe was on our staff. Um, yeah, and, that, and I've actually gave that, that idea to Simon. I actually gave that idea to some people in Florida, like, Get Joe Garcia on his own YouTube channel, help him establish it, help him advertise it so he could be the voice against this propaganda. Uh, and he actually came up with this idea like a, a, about a year ago, but there's nobody wants to give the money to that. It, it, it's what, what's so amazing. And I've, I've done an incredible amount of political work in Florida over the last 20 years. And I, you know, NDN is the one who did through research, uh, discovered these different electorates that you're talking about. And even within the Cuban community, there are three different mm -hmm. Cuban electorates, right? And when we did $3 million worth of television ads in 2004, we ran three separate Spanish campaigns, right? We had one campaign in Colombian Spanish, right. one in Puerto Rican Spanish, and one in Cuban Spanish um, in, in a statewide effort that we did. And so you're right that the granular, Florida is the hardest political state to operate in, in the country um, and we've continually underperformed there. And it's, it's a tragedy, I think, because it is a state that we won in 2012. Uh, we won the Cuban vote in 2012. We didn't just win the Hispanic vote in 2012. Mm -hmm. We won the Cuban vote in 2012. Um, and I think that some of the learning of how we did all that, Ruben, has left the family. It, we right. escaped through the, turn, the natural turnover that often happens. And to your point, this idea of a stable party and a year-round party that continue to learn and, and learn from mistakes and also that memory gets passed on and the things that worked get passed on. Um, you know, I, those of us who helped build the victory in 2012 were not involved in the statewide operation in 2020. And some of the things that we did were lost to history. We have to get better at those kinds of things, you know, mm -hmm. as a, a family. And I do think that you're right. As somebody, I, I ran for DNC chair in 2005 and I came very close to beating Howard Dean. And one of the, the whole ideas that we all talked about was this idea of needing to keep the parties open year round. And, and it's a, I totally agree with you on this. This is a, a deficiency in our strategic capacity as Democrats, given how much money we spend and raise every two years, we should be able to keep most of the major political parties open Absolutely. year round and and it's it's something we have to move towards it's more than a 50 state strategy it's a 12 month right. 50 state strategy I mean, if, if florida the florida democratic institutions i'm not going to say party because you know there's different levels of problems there right if we if they don't want to use that money sufficiently give it to arizona and give it to north carolina and give it to texas and we could work use that money that we blow on florida every year to organize you know um the rio grande valley I'll, I'll get the more, the, you know, the 100,000 more registrations we need in Arizona and then North Carolina and we're done. And then Florida can keep Florida being Florida. Well, let me, I'll conclude with this, Ruben, is that um, Jamie Harrison, who's likely to become the new DNC chair, yes. was, a, was a state chair. He cares about the, about the party infrastructure. He obviously did a, very, a great job during this election, which, but what people don't know about him is that He's a beloved figure in the party world, right? And he could be somebody for you in this, your big vision here of how to do this. He could be a real ally of yours, I think, uh, as to extend the Arizona model yeah. into other into other places. And Jamie was one of, my, one of my first donors when I ran for Congress. Really? <laughs> He's a good guy. Yeah. And any any uh, final thoughts today, Ruben? I I, I want to you know we covered yeah. a lot of ground today, but. Just want to give let you again. I, I mean, this is a you need to build political infrastructure to meet you know demographic or voter registration demands, and it has to stay around year round, and it has to be consistent. Um, if if you try to you know if you try to turn on and off you know voter registration or your political activism or organizers, it's just going to be fits and starts over again every year in and out, and you just can't do that. The Democratic Party is a coalition party. Uh, and it's harder for us to keep that coalition together. 
right? If, you know, if you ever think about it, why is it easy to organize Republicans? They're largely very much one major group of people, right? White people and tend to, you know, all listen to the same stations, the same media, right? We don't have that luxury, nor do I think we actually want to have that luxury, to be honest. But we have to be able to talk to all of our coalition uh, in all their ways that they communicate. And the only way you do that is you have to have a cons consistent political infrastructure, which is not sexy, right? Everybody wants to pay for the IE. Everybody wants to pay the money for that commercial. Nobody wants to pay, you know, the forty thousand dollars for that, you know, district organizer uh, per year because you don't see the return. The act, but but it does matter, you know, having organizers there all the time matters. Having a, a social media, uh, you know, content manager for the party matters, right? A PR person matters. These things matter year round. Uh, and, you know, that's the kind of investment you need to do in the meantime uh, to make sure your state stays competitive and stays blue. And 2022, you know, I, I, you know, I'm taking a break, you know, for at least one more month. Uh, and then I'm going to start harassing everybody in Arizona again to start preparing for 2022. But we need to make sure that we do, uh, we probably need to register another 50 to 60,000 more Democrats for 2022 minimum uh, to make sure that Kelly uh, gets reelected. And then depending on where redistricting goes, we'll also be targeting individual districts. That's what we, you know, we're starting to think about just for us two years from now. Four years from now, uh, we're going to have to actually do a lot of other stuff and we can get into subject matter on that. Another Thank you so much for taking so much time today. Thanks everybody for Thank you. being here. We're going to have a few more uh, sessions like this before the end of the year with people who played a major role in this last election before we start looking forward to the Biden era, which is coming very, very soon, thankfully. Uh, and so thanks for being with us. And Ruben, good luck with everything. Let us know what we can do, okay? Yes, talk to you soon. Okay, take care.